Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar for Black History Month. I'm Karen Gabay. I am a filmmaker, community filmmaker, a radio presenter and also a TV producer. And today we are going to be looking at the history of the cooperative movement through the lens of Black history. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to discuss the perceptions of the cooperative movement today globally and also here in the UK and we're going to encourage uh, you to uh, volunteer your thoughts when you can you can post your questions and thoughts in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we're also going to encourage the panelists to share their thoughts on this as well so I am going to introduce uh, you to our panellists and the panellists that we have today who are going to give their thoughts and insights are Liz McIver, Social Historian and Trust Manager at the Cooperative Heritage Trust. Hi Liz. Hi Karen, nice to be here. And welcome and uh, we're also now going to uh, see and hear from Claude Henriksen, MBE, who is the lead for Corrosive Communities at the Leeds Community Homes. Hi, Claude. Hey, how are you doing? Good afternoon. Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, welcome. And uh, we've got Rose Marley, who is the CEO of Cooperatives UK. Good afternoon. Hi, Rose. And Christopher Oliver, who's the Policy and Research Officer of the UBLA Initiative. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, so welcome uh, to today's conversation. I'm uh, just going to let you know that uh, a few things, few housekeeping rules. Um, the uh, closed captions are available. Uh, just click CC on the bottom of your screen. Uh, there's an option to view the full transcript with subtitles as well. And you'll be able to see the scrolling subtitles if you want to do that. And, and as I mentioned, there's an opportunity to put questions to our panel later on. So do put your questions in the Q&A box and later on we'll get through them as best that we can. But uh, we're going to speak to each of the panellists and just hear their thoughts. So first, I'm going to start with you, Liz. Uh, Liz, can I just uh, ask you a little bit about your role at the Co-op Heritage Trust? OK, so I'm the lead at the Co-op Heritage Trust. And it's a small team and a quite a young charity that was set up in Greater Manchester initially to look after the physical assets, the heritage assets of the UK cooperative movement. And it was done um, really to protect them because the co-op movement was changing quite a lot. So we have a physical museum that's in Rochdale, the site of the first successful retail consumer cooperative society, just one type of co-op that is. And we also have an archive, which is in central Manchester, Holyoke House. Um, but really, the story is national and international. So small sites, small team, big story. Um, so that's what we're set up to do. We're set up to protect those assets and to share them and to encourage people to learn through cooperative values and principles. And just let's tell us why um, social history is really important. Well, there's, there's a common understanding that, you know, if you understand the past, if you kind of are able to engage with it, that it helps you to plan for the future and it helps you to deal with issues in your present. Um, and there's a concern, really, that when people put things in the bracket of going, that's the past, we want to move on from the past, we don't want to focus on the past, that's true, but without the context of what's gone before, you can't as a society possibly hope to engage with the issues that come out of that past, that come out of that shared experience or shared heritage. Um, history keeps you grounded, it gives you identity, it makes you think about what matters to people, especially those whose history is erased or minimized. Um, and it gives you power, essentially, when you have an understanding of history and an acceptance of what's gone before, it gives people a power that they didn't have so it's really important for us to talk about all aspects of our history the challenging ones as well as the positive stories yeah absolutely because it just really gives you some like kind of grounding and and it just shines a light on areas of your life that maybe you just were unaware of really and I just want to ask you about the black history aspect of that as well because what have you been doing in terms of 
reflecting and taking a, a look and researching the black history that exists within the co-op movement okay well we have to go back in time a little bit to the start of these these conversations so we were already aware very much aware our small team of how white centric the story the traditional story of the narrative is around how the co-op movement got started who started it and how it spread um so we wanted to make some changes to that because it, it was a very polarized view really um and we, we were looking into that to begin with, but what really kind of galvanized us wanting to change this was that the, the kind of response to the George Floyd incident in America and that in society generally, especially with younger people, that really triggered something into looking at how we represent people and stories across the board, not just, you know, in terms of this particular part of history. Um, and really that that has an enormous amount of capacity for us to change the narrative so we started thinking well how can we how can we reassess this so there were several ways to look at it um firstly it looks on the face of it when you see an image when you walk into a building it looks very white and it looks very male and we're aware of that and that's because our history if you like as a movement is so complicated and and in a way diverse and difficult to get to grips with that most people only get the real surface level part of the story. So what they come away with is 28 white working class men in Rochdale, former cooperative, and then everyone copies it, it's exactly the same. And that means that that, that focus, that sort of visual idea gets stuck. Um, so for a lot of people, it's a white movement. And we know that's not true. It's absolutely not the case. And particularly internationally, lots of countries around the world have taken up cooperative values and principles and that is extremely ethnically diverse now and has been for you know a number of years but what we can't do is find people very easily in terms of diversity it's very difficult to find women it's difficult to find people of color or people from different ethnic backgrounds in the old history it's not impossible it's just hard um, and one of the reasons it's hard is because this is a working class history and working class people rarely write their own story. Most of the time that story is written by other people who don't experience that, you know, who are literate, who have power, who have influence. And when that story gets written by other people, some of that gets lost. So we know that women were involved in the early movement. We know people of color were involved in it. It's just really difficult to find them and pull them out and show visuals or evidence that that was the case. But, but we know they were there. Um, and one of the things we wanted to do was to look for people in the in the history, in the, the narrative, and try to find the links and try to interpret those links a little bit better in the way we tell the story and in the things people see. But it does mean facing quite challenging things. And on the first glance, the cooperative movement's history doesn't look as challenging perhaps as some other kind of movements or commercial organizations, but it doesn't mean it's squeaky clean and perfect either. So we know that cooperatives as societies traded in problematic goods from empire contexts, and that despite their kind of campaigns for equality and equity, we know that they lived in a society where that wasn't the norm or the case, and that even when cooperatives campaigned for race rights and things like that and equal pay, that it was still not an ideal and that there were people still who had opinions that now we would find racist or prejudiced or biased and it's about trying to sort of own that and say we don't want to pretend the cooperative movement was always perfect we want to be honest and say there were problems with it but there were good things as well so it's about a balanced picture yeah I mean lots of things that you said there which I know can, will be picked upon later but I think just one thing as well to say is that some of that history is like hiding in plain sight isn't it and it's also about now we've got that awareness about maybe kind of bringing that into into the story and, and into the reflection and asking people to to share that so that story can be included that's just a thought of mine there um, that's right uh, yeah. I was going to say one one of the things that really is striking when you're looking for people people's stories within a movement is that the movement doesn't focus on the individual, it focuses on the whole and the collective. So that's what makes it tricky, it makes it yeah, challenging. Right. 
and people think their story isn't special or important because they weren't the CEO of an organization or they weren't or they didn't achieve something by themselves that's not true because all of those individuals and their experiences build the collective so actually you think your story is not special or important or unique it is and we want to hear it fantastic thanks for that now I'm going to move on to Claude uh, because Claude you've got a disparate, different aspect of how you've been involved in the cooperative movement and uh, I know there's just lots of interesting elements there. So just want to tell us a little bit about your role, particularly maybe as well with Leeds Community Homes as well. Yeah, um, thank you. Thank you for the invite to this um, Black History Month event for the cooperatives. Yeah, um, what I'd like to kick off by saying is that um, in principle, my learning has been that whenever a group of people come together uh, around a common issue or a common situation they're actually a cooperative you know we've got lots of different organizations but actually whether it's community land trust community led housing you know they're all kind of cooperatives so Partner. <laughs> yeah yeah so 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 my, my my learning about cooperatives in principle being of that first generation of kids that was born, children that was born of the Windrush generation. You know, my mother come in the late fifties, I was born in the sixty. Um, we've had to kind of observe cooperation, people working together, because at first, so in Leeds, they set up the um, United Caribbean Association, which was different people coming from different Caribbean, even though there was African Caribbean, they were coming from different islands, Barbados, Trinidad, um, St. Kitts and Nevis, Jamaica, you know, so, so what they created was the United Caribbean Association. So in principle, that's a cooperative because it's a group of different people from different islands coming together. And what they then, because obviously in the 60s, we were su suffering under the no dogs, no Irish, no blacks. So they, our, our black parents had to come together around issues like housing, employment, the children's education, their own entertainment, dealing with the police, um, health churches. and well-being. Huh? Churches as well. Yep, churches. I was just coming to that. You just beat me to it. <laughs> Youth engagement. So all of these things were how we had to live within the system. So we were just naturally born in what is called clusters now, cooperatives. Um, so yes, yeah, so, you know, and um, for me, um, going on, just to, to come back to where, you know, the question was, was um, I, I got involved in a self-build back in, in the mid eighties um, when, being a, a young male was hard to get accommodation. Being a young black male was even harder to get accommodation. So we set up a self-build. A group of us came together, 12 of the 13 of us came together to look at the plan of building our own houses because we'd seen that it being done in Bristol. We'd seen a, a project called Zanzili in Bristol. But what on reflect further on in life, I found out that there's been community-led housing projects in Bristol, Birmingham, London, um, Liverpool, Manchester, which were Black-led housing projects. So they were like in the early 70s. So I, I, I'm, I'm standing on the, I, I realised I was standing on the shoulders of others that had gone before me. So at the end of the day, we took on building our own houses. We built them, um, 12 houses, 92,000 bricks, 52,000 blocks, um, and built a street of houses. So again, as a cooperative uh, and leading the way, I mean, I, I've gone on and I've done other things. And now I've, I became a cohesive communities worker with um, Leeds Community Homes, um, which gave me a, a chance to look at um, why there weren't more black people being involved in construction and building their own houses and taking control. So um, I, I became their EDI advisor, um, tr 
um, getting more black people to engage um, with community-led housing, which has gone on now. I'm now um, the EDI trainer with the 4 million homes and the cooperative CCH housing, um, teaching residents about being more involved, not just black and ethnic minorities, but all residents about being more involved. So becoming cooperative in the areas where they live, work together to kind of deal with landlords. So that's something that I'm on with as we speak. And we're training all over the country. So that's with the cooperative housing movement. Do you think that, um, you know, you, you've described what you've you've done there, but do you think that, you know, particularly, you know, uh, people from, you know, the African Caribbean and Asian communities realise that it's a cooperative? Would they describe it as that? Um, th that's what I'm kind of interested to know. Would You know, how yeah. would they see that? No, no, because... Um, because there's so many different structures out there now. So you can become a community-led house, you can become a housing project, but you can be a co-housing project, or you can be a self-built project. What I tried to say at the beginning of the conversation, the reality is for me, under the umbrella of people working together for a common aim, it's a cooperative, but it just, they just have different labels, but they're still, I mean, you know, Council officers are in principle like a cooperative because they've come together to manage the finance on behalf of the community and deliver the services. So you know what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say is that we live in a society that labels are stuck on things, but actually the, 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 the cooperative movement umbrellas all of them different types and different named or um, strategy groups. So, Claude, what would you say are the key challenges in getting more people from the global majority to actually be involved in the movement? Oh, wow. Well, you know, what I would say is, again, um, Community Land Trust, which is, again, a cooperative group, a group of people coming together to control land and build their services. The cooperative movement started in the civ out of the civil rights movement in America in the mid 60s. So community land trust again is something that is about people coming together and solving their own problem. And, and that comes out of, you know, and it came through to Europe, to England. So um, when it comes to black history, black history, black people have, have been at the forefront of showing people how to work together with all the things we've faced enslavement colonialism racism and we've come we're coming through all of that by coming together sticking together you know and and now in modern times that's called cooperative thank you for that uh interesting insightful stuff really and i love the way you, you can remember how many bricks you used to build that street <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah na na hey, 92,000 bricks, 52,000 blocks. I mean, just to mention, as I've seen them come up there just now, Chaco. Chaco is a co-housing project that just happened in Chapel Town, just finished. The, the, the residents have moved in. It's a global community, even though it's, you know, they're, they're people from all over the world. Or oh, they're, descend they're descended from people that are all over the world. We've got I'm the short down, we've got Irish people, we've got Asian people, we've got Caribbean people, we've got African people, we've got English people, we've got some Scottish people in there. So the global majority, the you know, as at, in, in one sense is in there as well with the natural majority. Thank you. Thanks. Now on to Rose. Uh, Rose, uh, can you tell us about a little bit about your background and your role as CEO of Cooperative UK? Hi, Karen. Um, yeah, my background is uh, quite eclectic and uh, diverse, really. Um, yeah, I came out of, uh, wonderfully came out of being born uh, and lucky enough to grow up as a teenager through the Manchester period in, in uh, Manchester. Um, so I um, spent quite a lot of my time as a youngster trying to get backstage and then that sort of became my career for the first uh, 10 years of my life. So I got into music management and all that type of stuff. Um, and actually, I'd say from my perspective, it was music that brought diversity into my life because I'm from the, the north of Manchester, which 
you know, growing up was pretty much a, a, a white working class ghetto, to be entirely honest. So um, it was really that music that brought diversity into my life and, you know, some level of um, empathy around the challenges. And when I, and without going into my career history, I had never sort of had this vision to kind of be CEO of, of Cooperatives UK and such a, um, you know, important role as well, I believe, for, for you know, for, for, for the greater good, for fairer society, for greater Manchester. And, you know, I've always been a social enterprise, um, a social entrepreneur and social reformer. And so I, when I was originally approached, I've only been doing this role for just over two years, and when I was originally approached by a recruitment agency to look at look at the role, I wasn't looking to move roles. I wasn't at all interested. And I'll be entirely honest with you, because this particular recruiter was hounding me. Um, I took his call after the fifth uh, time uh, and he did know me. Um, and he'd been leaving messages because he always used to ring me about various things that involved, uh, you know, uh, sort of like um, Catholic related kind of positions. And he was ringing me saying, it's not even religious. It's not. <laughs> Although Liz will slightly dispute that. Um, but uh, basically, it, like after the fifth time he rang me, he said, what is it? What's putting you off? And I said, have you seen the board? I'd go on the website and he said, what? And I said, it's like all white middle class, you know, and, and I said back all these stereotypes sandal wearing vegan middle class why like why would I want to be part of that that was my genuine reaction and even though I'd put myself now because of my career and, um, and kind of what I've done in, in the middle class bracket like, so I was quite you know coming out of that like working class piece I was really quite offended um about the way the cooperative movement was was perceived and then the, and then the comment I got back was that's exactly why we want you to to, to look at the role um, and again, it's really challenging. There's lots of reasons on, on, on our board in particular, and lots of challenges around kind of the diversity um, of, of that. And by diversity as well, I'm looking at social diversity and all the neurodiversity. So our board is actually more diverse than it maybe looks in a picture. Um, however, um, big part of our strategy, you know, you know, has this diverse, you know, our whole aim is to create a strong, sustainable and diverse movement for the UK so that's in there strategically so that's why we're doing things like you know obviously stimulating your belly work which we're going to go on to to talk about um but I really love what Claude said earlier and this really sings to me because like I say when you kind of look at my history people go and how did you end up doing that well actually every band I've worked with is a cooperative uh you know so it's this idea that people coming together and again as part of our strategy what you'll start to see now our membership categories used to be you know, we have this whole like when I first came into the role and I sat down with the with the board and I said, we want to be diverse, right? Everybody's like, yes, of course we do. We want to be inclusive. Yes, of course we do. And then I said, well, why have we got this like, you know, 300 page rule book about exactly what you have to do <laughs> to be able to join this movement? Uh, so we've really relaxed out some of those things that Claude's talking about. And we do have a category now for social enterprise, social purpose. People who might not be formally constituted as a co-op, they might not exactly be in that, let's say, very, very specific type of constitution, whether that's, you know, community um, housing, uh, community land trust, whether that's community benefit societies, whether that's, you know, co-ops, they're all in the, the co-op category. But now, let's like say, you might have more of a community interest company that doesn't have... Um, you know, the democracy built into the, the constitution, but they're there for the ethical and the fair trade and the social purpose. And, and why wouldn't we want those people to be part of that movement? So we're doing as much as we can strategically to open up uh, these uh, doors. Um, but I'd say to, to Claude's point, what, you know, what I also believe is lots of people are working cooperatively and running cooperatives, and that's not how they would describe themselves, and that's not how they believe they are. But we've got tools, actually, that could help them, because actually it's quite hard cooperating, just to be clear. Um, <laughs> it's not easy getting everybody to a, a consensus, and it's not easy, you know, cooperatives tend to be trying to solve problems that are really hard that the market's failed and private businesses aren't in because it's really hard and there's no money in it so it's not an easy place to be at all so whatever type of cooperative uh you are let's say we want to kind of um come to you and again part of our strategy does talk about inspiring communities in, in the right voices and in the right places as opposed to 
um sort of sitting back and waiting for that to happen but yeah loads and loads of challenges you know liz alluded to some of them historically but you know I won't pretend as well that it, that it that it's easy going forward and um, there's a lot of um you know um unconscious biases um and you know it's something that we really really have to try hard and continuously try hard to break down some of these barriers because genuinely i don't find that people when i say like, people do want to be inclusive and people do want to open up the opportunity but i think we've, we've got some structural issues about how we've we've kind of enabled that not being an easy thing and also rose to say that because people aren't always aware that necessarily they're, that they're operating as a co-op, but the of, often things with with you know uh, you know Black Asian Chinese communities is you're not aware of things to make you more robust or to help you be more efficient to give your co-op longevity, and by opening up the fact that you're more open to this, that will be in itself more inclusive, won't it? Because you know, when I learned about this, I thought, oh, gosh, there's, there's been lots of occasions where being able to tap into your toolkit or your thoughts would really help. Uh, completely. I think there's, there's, a, there's a long way to go. I think we've made, you know, some some uh, good steps uh, forward, but, the, but there is a long way to go. And actually, you know, our arms are wide open for people who want to, to, to who've got ideas about how we could do it better because um, we've got lots to learn. What would you say the difference is between how cooperatives are perceived here in the UK and abroad and overseas? What are the differences? Well, it's really, when you say co-ops, it's so diverse, like Claude, uh, you know, had touched on there. So I think you have pockets that, that might be more working class or, or less working class in different types and sexes of, of cooperation as well. So you've got the consumer societies and like Liz said, you know, that very much came out of that kind of working class, you know, food uh, poverty. Bizarrely, we're back here again, aren't we? Um, but, you know, um, co-op group tends to have uh, shops now in more affluent areas. And if you look at, you know, the, the uh, uh, co-op group, um customers um i don't think they're the same type of customers as they would have been when the, the cart movement started and again you know what you do see in in certain types particularly i see this in 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 some types of worker co-ops where the volunteering model is important and people contributing well you know volunteering is a privilege you know being able to work for no money um already <laughs> rules out a whole bunch of uh, people uh, so you get older people because they've got more time maybe if they're retired but also you get people that have got you know a kind of cushion in their income stream who are who are able to volunteer so I do think this I don't think it's easy easy to say across the board um, whereas like I say in some of the um, more creative and cultural co-ops you do get a lot more diversity but that's the same across all our sectors in the UK internationally as Liz said you know again a huge privilege and opportunity that I have to lead this movement here in the UK and you know I do get to go to places uh, like I went to Brazil uh, last year and um, you know the um, uh, Akai Berry uh, you know uh, collecting mm -hmm. you know I was the only white person there you know so it is really different in different uh, territories across the world I don't think there's a kind of I don't think you can make the generalisation, but I'd say in the UK, from what I've seen more than anywhere else, it does present as as, as, as white and middle class, uh, if you have to describe it. And that's something, let's say, we've got to work hard to change those perceptions. And what do you think? I mean, uh, you've, you've, you know, you have covered it, but just to say, though, what do you think is missing to make that connection? You know, if you can kind of like capture that, what is it that, you know, are people intimidated by it? You touched on the fact that volunteering is you know is is a privilege because you know it costs time and money you might not have but you know what other things are missing that would like draw people even who are watching this to go do you know what I can actually contribute and make a change yeah I think there's so many like I say so many barriers the way we communicate I think our language is really confused and it's just so many things uh, when we say we're not diverse you know we're really old as well as a movement you know bringing in young people is a is a is a real uh, challenge so there's there's so many things that like we need to look at as a as a movement to be able to um address and you know achieve some of those things um so yeah from my perspective i think we've got like a, an understanding of, of quite a lot of 
uh, the issues. But one of the things that um, it, it, it does make me smile, um, but it is actually a challenge. Like when we do get people, particularly if you're prepared, if you're people that are, um, you know, uh, from a diverse background, and that can be young people, like I say, as well, um, and they start kind of, uh, they come to us, uh, or they're part of a co-op, or they're working with us, and um, everybody's so desperate, actually, to be able to welcome people to be with them, they do get a little bit mobbed, and you know, like they'll get asked to be on everything, yeah. you know. So you have young people, and you, then you start to see the same faces on all the boards yeah, and all yeah, the. Yeah. So it's like it's like getting that balance of kind of like say because you know you, you, that, like say that unconscious bias stuff where people um, recruit people like themselves and all that type of stuff that you generally get across you know business across all sectors but like I say I do I do see I do see these things and I do say it to people you know and I just like you know like they'll get asked to do everything and then it can be quite overwhelming and then they'll retreat uh, so I do think we need to you know um if we had more options maybe we wouldn't be putting it all on, on the same people but again like so we've got to work really hard to be able to do that thank you thanks Rose, for that now Christopher uh you've got exciting things to help tell us about uh, you belly and uh, your role there please Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, in Black History Month as well. Um, and I think Black History Month is very important to to engage in black study. Um, and which is which is a study of the history of the modern world in a way. Um, and and the development of um, both um, the Black Atlantic and the Caribbean and the Americas and um, out of that, but also Britain. And I think, and how yeah, race organizes that development. Um, and I think um, Umbele is, is an organization which um, I've recently joined <laughs> as, a, as a policy and research officer um and ubele um is taken from the swahili word um word meaning the future and and yeah ubele like follows a tradition um of of analyzing the sort of social economic political structures um of within britain that sort of organizes life and communities um and but particularly in relation to um community assets and and thinking about um african diasporic but also global majority community assets in britain and how they are um operating um within that environment that I described um, within the sort of, you know, the the social, economic, political structures that exist within Britain. Um, and I think, um, th yeah, this conversation is really interesting um, from what people have said so far. Um, and I think one, a backdrop perhaps to um, the conversation and, and perhaps and and reports that I've been reading um to you know in the I guess grounding myself in this role at Ubele is a is a is a report that um Ubele did um, in 2015 called A Place to Call Home and and it and it reviewed and Ubele work with um organizations and people across the country um including Claude um, and and over the last year, I think, Cop been in conversation with Cooperatives UK. Um, and and yeah, this, this report called A Place to Call Home uh, reviewed the status of 150 um, African diasporic organizations, um, community assets in the UK um, across the country. And there's 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 many insights I 
invite everyone to to read the report there's soon to be a revised edition of the report in the coming weeks um but one of the takeaways was that 54 percent of those african diaspora community assets um the the buildings had insecure futures um in uh, the and and therefore and there, and there are various reasons um around the sort of you know social economic con conditions in which those community assets are positioned um the, like the the various pressures on, therefore on the governance um of of those community assets this sort of changing demographics um and um the sort of intergenerational um well the the difficulty in succession planning um, um of those assets um and and also the sort of changing sort of nature of the economy as well um we now live in a sort of digital economy and and so therefore to what extent you know are these buildings and infrastructures attuned to um this sort of emergent um, digital economy um and therefore you know the services that these buildings and and organizations offer you know to what extent can they plug in to that that emerging digital economy um and and so yeah so Ubele um have been in conversation with as i said with cooperatives uk um about think thinking about um, community share models as and in relation to sort of cooperatives and community benefit societies um, as, a, as a model um, to think about the, the ownership of assets, um, to think about, you know, the social benefit of such a model um, in terms of asset-based development. Um, and 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 so we've we're, we're at the formative stages of of um, imagining and designing a research method to first um, yeah review map um, the, the existence of um, black and global majority cooperatives in in Britain um, and. But also, as as has already been stated, you know, to think about, because because I think one of the tensions that I think the the panelists have identified is this tension between the legal definition of a co-op um, and a community benefit society or a cooperative, um, and then the perhaps the the black and global majority cultural forms which exist and um operate um such as the partner um to produce um you know um the ability to acquire housing for example or um but also to arrange um finances and 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 raise yeah raise finances um, for various sort of economic um, social activities. Um, I was speaking to a colleague yesterday who's Kashmiri, and she spoke of um, the committee, um, which is actually the word um, in, in her community for a partner. So a committee um, is, is very very much yeah uh, for people operative. who don't know should we say though for people I mean, we know what oh, partner is but oh, not everyone on. does know what partner is um, yeah. so, go on. so it's it's basically isn't it it's a group of people coming together in the community where you know so say 20 people join and each of those people have to put money aside once a week or once a month and then it rotates 
in terms of who gets their then pay out of the total kind of like sum of money and it allows people to go on holiday to buy school uniforms to buy a house and and in the 50s and 60s I mean it's it's continued on the 50s and 60s that's what people use the pardon order committee in order to buy their houses buy their homes yeah. and um, and there's a big debate about pardons now about are the ne- are the, uh, are us as generations carrying it on and what are the problems and some people are saying you know maybe it should be put into a, a, a kind of a more cooperative sp- space formally because some are, are very successful and others have issues uh, I don't know if Claude and Christopher if you agree with that kind of summary of what partner is yeah, I, I, I would I would add, just add to it because if I'd have done my presentation, it was I, I'd broken it down. Yeah. Partner hand was kind of set up for those that don't know because the, our parents couldn't get get bank loans, they couldn't get bank accounts. So what they did, they pooled their money, and if one selected person got it every, at every moment, and they could use that as a deposit to get their house or the, a deposit to get a car again, as a cooperative move, as a group of people coming together. So that's that's how they tackled banking back in the 60s um, until, until banks thought we were credible enough as black people to have bank accounts. You know, we, th- back then we could get post office accounts and we could get building society, for example, like accounts, but we couldn't get proper bank accounts. So yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to ask you, Christopher, because just to be talking about community assets, and um, and I think that there's a discussion around that, particularly at the moment. I know Manchester and London in particular, and I just wondered if this is where you're coming from. Like, for example, the uh, Caribbean um, houses or West Indian community clubs, and what's happened is they're part of the community, but they were never owned. So you're at the, you're vulnerable to a council or a landlord may be taking away your right to that building. And so that's where um, there's a vulnerability and also the succession issue. Is that the kind of thing that you're talking about in terms of when you're saying about community assets? Yes, yeah. And um, and a lot of, from the research that Ubele did, um, a lot of these community assets and cent- the centres that you describe um, were set up in the wake of um, ver- various forms of what we could describe as social unrest, um, for example, the you know 1981 uprisings, um, and you know an organisation that I've worked with in in Manchester, uh, the Moss Side and Hume Development Trust, for example, was yeah. set up after um, the 1981 um, uprisings in Moss Side. Um, and therefore, so, so so I think it's interesting to s- consider the conditions within which um, a given centre or building or organisation emerges, at, and and because I think number one, I think for I guess my elders or um, that is you know that is a significant moment which then gave rise to a um you know a center um and then but then you know over time um those that are sort of understand the sort of history and um the political economic social conditions in which that arose um they they get older and perhaps and maybe this is a indication or a, a nod to you know ed, the, the education of of my generation and and or the lack thereof of you know these histories and and therefore perhaps not necessarily understanding the significance of such centers um, for um, certain forms of community development I know that's the case with me and I've, I've learned a huge amount from um, people I've elders that I've worked with um, in London and particularly Manchester. Um, so, so I think education is really important for, um, yeah, understanding these histories, but then also therefore designing um, appropriate models for our contemporary sort of 
situation. Um, and and yeah, to, to what extent is the cooperative model or, a, you know, how can it serve us in, the, in, in this instance, in these instances? And also, particularly in relation to those 150 organizations that I mentioned that Rebele uh, reviewed, you know, how many of them could benefit from um, these models? Um, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll come back to you on that. But like Liz, I just wondered, you know, like for you, are there any, you know, um, are there any examples heritage wise of good examples that people could learn from that, you know, that could be uh, that could be adapted? And, and 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 even maybe you know we're talking about Black History Month. Are there any examples from that from from that particular aspect and that lens as well of of history that that could assist us here? Yeah, there there are some. Um, I think depending on what what it is you're specifically looking for, there are lots of good comparisons, particularly when it's community led activity. So okay, once you take yourself out of the retail part of the, you know, the obvious business transactional part of the, the movement's history, and you kind of look at the communities themselves, actually, for one thing, most of those communities in the UK are more diverse than they seem at first glance, especially when you look at what they produce. So most of the time, what they produce is writing on paper, rather than necessarily photographs or even films. But even when they do, those photographs they're taken usually with a lot of bias so they'll leave out the people that don't fit the narrative of what they're trying to explain so that they look more credible this is kind of going way back um but we have modern examples as well so when it comes to the the diversification of the movement worker cooperatives different types of platform cooperatives music cooperatives actors people who as we've just been talking about who use if not a very rigid version of the cooperative model they use the values of the cooperative movement to to sort themselves out particularly you see it as claude mentioned in the 60s and 70s when people are saying we need help with this we need to come together we need to collectivize there are examples of it but what i find really interesting is that sometimes you'll see that this group exists and they're doing some work and once they and their immediate sort of membership has established themselves and they've given themselves better education opportunities and they've moved on, they've bought houses, they've gotten into college, they've got better jobs. That then folds, that that community sort of set up, the, the building might still be there maybe that they used and they might be used for different things, but that initial group and how it ran itself, its governance, that's gone then, it, it evaporates. And you think, well, actually, there's probably more to learn from interviewing people. So we're not talking about 200 years ago, we're talking about 20 years ago, 30 years ago. If we can capture some of that learning, uh, a little bit like Christopher was saying, that pe what people don't think is relevant, they say, oh, we opened this in the 70s or we did this in the 80s because we had nobody to mind our kids because we had to work two jobs or whatever it ha happens to be. They came up with a community solution, but they don't think they have anything to teach often. They think, that, oh, that was in the past. Things have changed now. Young people have changed their, you know, what they're interested in. They won't understand it in the same way. But we need that evidence, don't we? So where we might be able to find examples where we've said, oh, there's an, an Indian women's cooperative that are making these, these goods for sale because they can't get into a market, so they have to do it for themselves. There's an example. But what about the more modern examples? We're not going as far back. We're going back to maybe parents or grandparents generations and actually that's the emotional connection for a lot of younger people oh my gran was involved in something you know it doesn't have to still exist for it to have been successful absolutely so I, I, mean, think... I mean part of my work is is doing that and you are right once you start asking people they do share really good examples of good practice and they don't but it's not really documented um and you know examples are n nurses um dance groups Irish dance groups, black dance groups, you know, Indian dance groups, amazing examples of, of how, you know, train generations of people to be very successful, but it's kind of taken for granted as well, isn't it? And I think just to say, you know, maybe as well, it's time for people to, you know, they can put questions in the Q and A box, but even to share those examples, I think, because we're like prodding people's consciences, you know, and sometimes, you know, parents, grandparents tell stories and, you know, you kind of put it to one side until it's ready for you to do it. And then really it's about tapping into that in the way that, you know, 
Claude said that, you know, he's done, you know, and, you know, Rose will even have that history, you know, in terms of music, there'll be lots of examples that might have taken for granted, I think. And Rose just wanted to ask you about a social investment in community shares, you know, is there a way to, that you're looking at to make that more diverse and to make people more aware of it? Yeah, uh, we need to make people more aware of community shares uh, generally, actually. But in terms of, like I was saying, like from a strategic point of view, we're doing as, as much as we can. So we have signed up to the social investment um, manifesto and we have done some work on Sharia law and community shares. And obviously really excited to see uh, what comes out of the work with uh, Ubele. We've also, uh, we have a, 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 a booster fund and now an access to booster fund. So it means when you raise a community shares, and sorry, like I say, I need to raise awareness just in case anybody viewing isn't aware, community shares are like crowdfunding, um, but you get to own a piece of the co-op. So you get that um, equity piece in there as well. And it's only available, it's through the Financial Conduct Authority and here at Cooperatives UK. We operate the community shares unit, which is the, the soft regulation of um, that market. And it needs to be soft regulation. It's interesting what you said about Pada because it, it's getting the balance, isn't it? It's money, it needs regulating, but also you don't want to kind of um, stranglehold the thing that's doing the good bit. So it, it, it really is um, you know, quite challenging. But what we've been doing um, in that space in particular, in our access to booster, when we went, so say for example, uh, I'll give you the example of an easy one, a football club um, within Shaw FC, uh, not far from here, um, wanted to become a fan-led football club and they wanted to set out the drainage and put in a new stand. So they put out a community shares offer and the fans uh, raised £50,000 and then Cooperatives UK through the Booster Fund matched that for another £50,000. On our access to Booster Fund, uh, we've got really specific targets to try and get into, you know, again, let's say more diverse communities. That's that's really challenging anyway, um, but also what's challenging, and, and I, I do have, um, I'm a little bit poacher turned gamekeeper in this conversation because I raise social investment as a social entrepreneur. And me, as now a middle-class white woman, but coming from that working class heritage um I find it really difficult to be able to speak in the language of investors. Um, and there's a, there's a huge language barrier there. Um, you know, they kind of, you know, nobody wakes up and says, I want to start a co-op. You know, people um, actually tend to kind of just find themselves cooperating or they're actually trying to solve a problem. You know, like you say, the local pub or, you know, my community centre is about to be taken off us. People have a problem and they end up in actual fact running a business and it might be a cooperative or run a, other form of social enterprise. And suddenly, not only are they having to get all these skills of being able to run a business, then when they need some pump priming and investment into that, you know, the, the way investors talk to them is like as though they've been to Harvard for you know, 10 years. There's, there's a real mismatch in, in social investment generally on this. So the big piece to unpick there, but let's say we've kind of done some very specific stimulation around those markets, but, but we're aware just putting it in a manifesto or just saying we're going to do it, you know, it doesn't magically happen. There's a lot of hard work and a lot of hard graft to kind of, um, you know, get to that. So again, I think we, we're just on the beginning of that journey, but I'm expecting us to find that that'll need a lot more support. So, you know, again, it's this thing about what you were asking about the white and the middle class, you know, we've got a 65% increase in community pubs, actually. We've just produced our cooperative and mutual uh, report for 2023. Um, and that's one of the big findings that came out of it. Well, actually, lots of that is in rural white communities. Um, and, and you start to think about that and it's important to the village, you know, they've got this pub that they want to maintain, but actually then you'll get a lot of people in that village that probably when you go back to the volunteering piece, Karen, oh, well, I am actually a, a financial accountant and now I'm actually already a governor on a school and I know how to do governance and I'm, you know, so, so you're tapping into um, a, a, an audience that has um, already got quite a lot of those skills are needed to be able to uh, deliver on a community shares offer so I, I I suspect not only is it going to be hard to find people <laughs> hard to convince people hard to get people to kind of start up I believe that there'll be quite a lot of support needed along the way as well 
Um, so yeah, just wait. We, we sadly there's no magic wand we can wave here, um, and we've just got to keep keep going and keep trying and and be grateful of those little wins and not not shy away from. Like I said, you know, I don't take the word word overwhelming lightly. I do think it's quite overwhelming the task in hand, but that shouldn't stop us from keeping trying. Thanks for that. Now, um, just before we wrap up, I've got one question from the audience. Well, we've got more than one question, but the one question I'm going to put to you, which is uh, uh, very current at the moment, is does being part of a co-op make you feel equipped to stand up to the current challenge in multiculturalism and the rise of culture politics? What can co-ops do? If we can each briefly answer that. I'm going to come to you firstly. <laughs> wow, that's a question. It is, um, it? Well, OK, the complexity of representing cooperativeness which is supposed to be politically neutral but of course by being cooperative we are inherently being political because we're standing up for people's rights um, and, and equity and that's not the same as equality equity and equality is not the same thing because we know we have to do more for people in order for them to have equal opportunity to raise their level of equity um, I think being part of a co-op for most people who knowingly join a co-op, they join it because of the, you know what that movement represents. But like Rose and, and all the other panelists have said, some people accidentally start a co-op because they're trying to solve a problem. Um, I think that the thing for us to remember, the, the sort of heritage keepers, if you like, is not to be frightened of getting it wrong. We have to be open to having conversations and to looking to fill the gaps in our our narrative and what we collect and to be not put off by the pressure that can be put on by culture wars, which are a distraction, let's be fair, from what is the real issues in our society and dealing with those. So we, you know, most people who are aware of these, you know, these pressures are also aware that there are things that we really need to do to put pressure on our government and our our systems, our society to make those changes. We need to be part of them and we need to be able to, as much as possible, reflect that within our own practice and to recognise it and to call out, you know, when it's going wrong or we're not doing it properly. So I, I know that's a little bit of a woolly answer, but I think it's something that most of us are really aware of. Claude? Um, I think in this modern time, every organization should have an equality diversity and inclusion policy it should have um at board level at staff level and at membership level it should have a plan of how it's going to implement that because some of them won't have them now it should have a plan how it's going to implement its policy and it should have an evaluation tool and funders should look at organizations whether it's cooperatives or whatever and, 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 and they should be looking at the nine characteristics that are highlighted in the Equalities 2010 Act, and they should be ensuring that representation for all groups based on the nine characteristics, race is one of them, um, is, in, 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 is, is, is upheld. Um, so that's what I want to see. I want to see everybody being understanding whether you're a board member or a staff member, you have to be, you know, you have to be dealing with equality. You have to be pushing that. It has to come from all levels. I take the point of government. Government is a separate entity. They talk a lot about it, but they're not delivering. We need to see more black people in, in positions of power and, and sharing their knowledge. Well, thank you for that, Rose. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to do this is is because I also want um, ideas as well. I say we, you know, we're doing um, e even the fact that I want to say we're doing what we can from the position we're in is the wrong way round. Um, so my uh, challenge actually is I can't see who who, who asked that question. I was just looking. I, I, I'd like uh, whoever asked that question if you've got ideas actually to to share them um and again like claude said um you know the awareness of it and actually um not just putting the policy in place but are you evaluating it against, against it and how you're doing and, and, and just asking yourself those tough questions and holding uh, the mirror up is what i'd say and i think we're in a period where culture wars are, are quite frightening really so we've got to stand up and, and be strong together in in standing up to that yeah christopher
sorry about that um yeah i think it's a good question i think um well i guess it's interesting it's important maybe to make a distinction um because legally cooperatives um aren't necessarily designed to provide social benefit um them they're, they're designed to benefit um their members um as opposed to um, a community benefit society which is legally defined to benefit um, a community and it, it has to you know um, benefit a community in order for it um, to exist but that's not to say that cooperatives shouldn't um, benefit a community and 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 to be designed to meet a sort of social need um, for example Mbele um, have just set up a housing cooperative um, called Gida Housing Cooperative um, and I'll post a link in the chat um, hopefully everyone can see it including the audience yes um, if you can because we've got we've got a wrap so if you can do okay. that yeah and yeah so that, I was just going to say that but then also that's that question um, or more broadly to what extent can you know cooperatives or community benefit societies support black and glo global majority communities in in, 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 in terms of asset-based development to attend to various sort of social needs is a question that um, we're we're exploring with cooperatives UK so as Rose said we'd be very interested and it's an open invite to have further discussions like that with with people that are interested thank you thank you so much i mean we know this can conversation could continue hopefully this is part one because it's just fascinating uh, so much to learn and experience from all of you on this call and we've had somebody in the chat saying that uh, the cooperative heritage trust museum is a great place to visit so if you look that up um uh, i'm sure as well uh, liz will welcome you so just to say thank you for joining us and for witnessing this thank you to liz mckiver who is the social historian trust manager of the cooperative heritage trust Thank you to Aaron. Rose. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to Rose, Rose Marley, CEO of Cooperatives UK, and to Claude Hendrickson, uh, MBE, uh, Leads for Cohesive Communities at Leeds Community Homes. A bit of a mouthful there. Thank <laughs> you, Claude. And, um, and finally, to Christopher Oliver, Policy and Research Officer for Bailey Initiative. And we look forward to seeing what unfolds with you there, Christopher, and all the work that you're doing. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, as we said, a recording will be available for you to watch. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you. much, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good Black History Month. Exactly. Yeah. You too.